Welcome to Braggsville is about four UC Berkeley undergraduates who travel from Berkeley to Braggsville, Georgia, the center of Georgia, where they stage a performative intervention, as they call it, which means that they attempt to protest a Civil War reenactment, and that protest goes helter-skelter. That's author T. Geronimo Johnson talking about his award-winning novel, Welcome to Braggsville. And this is Artworks, the weekly podcast produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. As you heard Geronimo tell us about Welcome to Braggsville, four kids from Berkeley go to Georgia to protest a Civil War reenactment with a pretend lynching. What could go wrong? Well, actually, pretty much everything you might expect, yet not in any way that you'd predict. That's the power of Johnson's imagination, observation, and talent. Darren is a 19-year-old white kid who's from Braggsville and returning home to make a political, social, historical statement with his three friends, Lewis, a kung fu comedian from California, Candace, a righteous do-gooder from Iowa, and Charlie, a preppy inner-city kid from Chicago. Southern small town meets West Coast political correctness. And Johnson is an equal opportunity satirist, make no mistake about that. But he doesn't simplify his characters. He deepens them and their circumstances, and so shines a light on the ways we talk through and over each other, those times we try to communicate about race and history. Welcome to Braggsville is darkly funny, tragic, audacious both in plot and execution, and profoundly thoughtful. When I spoke with T. Geronimo Johnson, of course I wanted to know what inspired this book. It's hard to say that there was one single source of inspiration. I, I lived in the South for quite some time. I um, in many ways identify with that region and uh, consider myself uh, Southern. And so when I lived there, I would pass uh, Civil War reenactments on occasion and just knowing a little bit about the history, I had always had this idea in the back of my head about what a Civil War reenactment would look like if you had people playing sort of a larger cast of characters than only those who were on the battlefield. What would happen if you could actually involve some of those whose freedom was at stake at the time? Before we get into the meat of the book more, let's talk about these four characters. And I'd like to start with Darren, who is the UC Berkeley student who's from that small Georgian town. Yeah, you know, Darren is someone who has gotten as far away from home as possible. He's, he's picked a school on the other side of the world, it feels, both uh, culturally and geographically. His joke is that he couldn't get farther from home unless he were to learn how to swim. But once he ends up out in Berkeley, he, he has a hard time trying to reconcile the world as he knows it or as he knew it in this small Georgia town, which is still very much segregated, with the values that he's being exposed to at UC Berkeley. And it's partly because of this uh, anxiety he has about being from the South that he is so willing to make this trip because in a way he wants to prove that nothing can go wrong or that nothing should go wrong and, and that this uh, reenactment is just an, an innocent uh, celebration of the city's heritage. And he is, you know, to my shock, actually uh, uh, encouraged by his professor to do this. His professor does see the potential in the project. So the professor plays a, a role in that he does not forbid them from doing it, but he's definitely not the final Oh, no, he's influence. not at all, yeah. but it's yeah. just like the one adult in the room. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, might have yes, thought this is true. could have talked them back a little bit. Right. Anyway, that's just my own commentary. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about Candace. Candace is one of the four little Indians, as they call themselves. Uh, yes, and Candace uh, comes from Iowa. Both of her parents are professors, so she is, unlike um, Darren, a second or third generation college student, and she feels much more at home in this environment 
And so her focus is not on trying to fit in, but um, instead on speaking up for injustice whenever she sees it. Now, she also considers herself to be part Native American because she's about one-eighth Native American, and so that's a banner that she ends up flying uh, rather high uh, over the course of the book, though I do appreciate her empathy. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah. You know, honestly, she annoyed the crap out of me. She was the one person I found so annoying, and I thought Darren was right when she talked about her abusive parents, and Darren translated that into... She wasn't spoiled as much as she thought she should be. It was sort of not. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> of course. Of course. That's a good catch. That's a good catch. And then there's Charlie. Yes. And Charlie comes from a single parent household. He did not have a lot of money growing up. He's from an urban area in Chicago, predominantly black neighborhood. But he had the benefit of attending a boarding school on a football scholarship. So while his arrival at Berkeley is something he doesn't question his right to have in the same way that Darren does, because Charlie has earned this academically, he is still uh, struggling with fitting in. Unlike the other three, Charlie is a bit more conservative. Plus, he has this secret that he he is hiding that he's uh, been keeping to himself for a number of years. I read Charlie as somebody who simply couldn't afford to lose. Exactly. Exactly. Charlie feels as though he has uh, more at stake, and Charlie does not feel confident that if he squanders one opportunity, he will easily find himself with others to consider. So each opportunity that uh, comes his way, he tries to make the most of. And then there's Lewis, the Asian-American kid who is the native Californian. Of course, yes. There is uh, Lewis, who is... um, so many people's favorite character, you know. Uh, Lewis is the the native Californian who has a very different perspective uh, on the world than his friends, and he's the one who kind of uh, lights the fuse to get people's attention. And he's also not afraid to say things that offend people, uh, to shock them out of their complacency. And it's important that he wants to be a comedian and he wants to be the next Lenny Bruce Lee, which is a very yes, good line. He, he, <laughs> Yes, he wants to be the, the next uh, kung fu comedian. When, when anyone asks him, well, who, who's Lenny Bruce Lee? You know, that's his answer. See, there is no Lenny Bruce Lee. Hence, <laughs> <laughs> there, there is a need. There is a need for me. You know, but he, he also is in this position where because he's Asian, specifically Malaysian, he is often assumed to be everything other than what he is in terms of his ethnicity. So he's often viewed as being, say, Middle Eastern or uh, you know, Muslim, or any, any number of things that he isn't, but people tend to project on him a lot of their anxieties. And so he's developed this comedic sensibility as a sort of foil and a kind of force field. Describe Braggsville, because I think it's important to get a sense of that town. You know, uh, <laughs> how to describe Braggsville? It's definitely not in Lonely Planet as a, uh, <laughs> as a destination. <laughs> You know, Braggsville bills itself as the city that love built in the heart of Georgia. It's this um, mythical city dead in the center of the state. And it is a city that was founded by the leader, Bragg, who felt over the years that this city was being looked over and never received the credit that it was due So it never had the opportunity, for example, to be the capital of Georgia, even though it is geographically located precisely where the capital should be. And uh, even when they apply to host the Special Olympics, that request is denied as well. So you have this town that feels as though they haven't received their, their just rewards, even though they have sent more Special Forces soldiers per capita than any other American city, off to fight on behalf of, of the country. So this is, where, this is where Darren is coming from to begin with, a, a city that feels a little bit a downtrodden and a little bit under heel and very much unappreciated for its contributions to the fabric of the culture. And it's also a city where everybody knows one another and many people are related to one another. Darren seems to be related to half the town. Yes, it is indeed a city where everyone knows everyone else's business 
and everyone else's ancestors. So they've all lived in this small town for several generations. It is uh, decidedly segregated, so the white residents live in Braggsville proper, and they all know each other. And then the black residents live in an area of the county known as the Gully, and the Gully is very distinct from the town proper. And between these two areas, there is a wood that is said to be a haunted wood or like a haunted forest that's known as the holler. And so between the black and the white population, you have this uh, actual physical barrier that's said to provide like more than just a physical barrier, but actually pose a great risk, you know, to your to your soul and spirit. It's haunted. If you, yeah, if you try to force your way through. Yeah. Now, this is your world that you created. Tell me why you chose to populate it with these four people primarily. Well, I was trying to um, find a way to explore the difficulty of talking about some of the more sensitive uh, subjects that we're dealing with in the public arena today, sexuality, race, class. But also I wanted to create a space or a canvas that was large enough to allow different points of view and different perspectives to collide and and feed and and bounce off of one another. And so I knew that I needed characters that uh, could each provide a distinctly different perspective on what it means to live in America today and what it means to be in college at this point in our history. And not just any college, but Berkeley. And the Berkeley you describe is certainly smart, and it's earnest, and it's well-meaning, but the level of pretension and just plain ridiculousness is certainly given an equal hearing <laughs> in your book. <laughs> you know, that, that is definitely something I wanted to explore. There, there is a point where our sensitivity to language, um, you know, for instance, which is a big part of being politically correct, but there's a point where our sensitivity to language can itself seem to shut down conversation. And that's one of the things that the the four characters are, are wrestling with. You know, what happens when someone who you would consider an ally doesn't know the most recent term for a particular race or sexual orientation, and then in speaking about that group says something that people find, you know, offensive, using an antiquated term that people find offensive, can create a situation where this person who really wants to be an ally feels um, completely disempowered to participate in any kind of useful or um, or helpful way. So still, I really wanted to explore that language as well, and that's something that Darren is wrestling with coming from a, a small town where they have not had any courses on, say, for example, intersectionality. Very few of us or, have. Yeah. <laughs> right. Of course. Yeah. Very. Yeah. Very few of us had, or you know, just any of the uh, new ways of thinking about some of the struggles that we're facing as a society. I was so fascinated in the way both Berkeley and Braggsville use language, and in very few instances is it used to clarify or explain it tends to obfuscate and manipulate. That does tend to happen. That uh, tends to happen. You know, what happens, though, when, it, when, when you're dealing with the language of an in-group or of jargon, be it Berkeley or Braggsville or some subset, you have a group of people who already share certain common values, and so the language often does not need to be as explicit because they are, are already in agreement on these shared values and on morality. And so what the book ends up doing is giving space for this jargon or for these tribal ways of speaking without explaining what these things often mean so that the reader can have the experience of processing this and a sort of sitting with the effect that the, that the language has on you as opposed to uh, me telling the reader what they should or should not think about the various terms that are used throughout the book. Well, the thing that I find so compelling about the book is that nothing is black or white. It's it's not what it means. It's It's exactly what it means. It's layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. So I really appreciate the complications 
of how Charlie, because he's there visiting Darren's family, is immediately accepted in Braggsville, as is Lewis. But at the same time, we see how things can go horribly wrong. We see that through through various people. And I think the character of Darren's cousin, Quint, was one of the most interesting to me. Because you make it impossible to pigeonhole, and that is a good thing. You know, Quint is um, you know, one of my favorite characters as well. When, when I first started writing this book, one of the things I'd, I'd been thinking about be- between both the first novel and this one is the difference between what we are thinking and, and what we will publicly admit to. And so when, it, when I came to Braggsville, I wanted to push deeper in, into that than I had with the first novel. And so I started thinking about not only um, what we won't admit we're thinking, but what we don't even know we're thinking, because that's really what's driving the car. And in this or any given society, we inherit a lot of uh, perspectives and, and attitude and views on others that aren't our views, right? They're, they're handed down to us, perhaps from our parents, or we might pick them up from, from the media. And so in thinking about Braggsville and thinking about these four characters, what I wanted to have space for in the book is for the reader to kind of, uh, not kind of, but to definitely experience the extent to which sometimes the characters are driven to do things but don't exactly know why, you know. And this is what Darren starts unpacking towards the end of the novel. You know, to that end, I wanted the town to be kind of a character itself in a way that lets you feel the spirit and the history of it and feel how that history and that spirit is affecting all of the people within the town, even though they may not realize it. Yeah. And the way language operates in this book, this book is in different narrative styles, from college essays to stream of consciousness to straight up storytelling. Yeah, I was I was playing with that a bit and in putting together a lot of, a lot of the dialogue and thinking about writing about race today or homophobia today or or um, sexism today, I knew that I needed to have many different voices so that the reader would have a chance to hear. I think there's so many things that we've heard about, you know, racism or sexism or homophobia or social justice overall. There's so many things that we've heard that people hear certain trigger words or code words, and mentally they just cover their ears. And so for the book to be more effective, I knew it needed to have a few different voices so that people might hear a new way of thinking about some of these things, but also that it needed to demand a different attention from the reader, that using the different voices and getting rid of the quotation marks would create a space where the reader would have to come a little bit closer to the book. And if a reader can figure out in those first few chapters how the book is working, I feel like what this gives you is a much more uh, valuable and immersive experience of thinking about these ideas than I would have been able to offer a reader if I'd used a more traditional approach and just told a straight narrative all the way through. There's actually a a really interesting scene where Darren and his cousin Quint are at a late night improvised barbecue. And the next chapter has a term paper about barbecue. Yes. (laughs) I taught for years and I just sort of held my head and shook it. It's like, oh, have I been there? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> now now no one's going to buy the book that's my joke you know tell people there's a an academic essay in there and that's one more reason to pass over it <laughs> at the bookstore I'm sorry <laughs> but <laughs> it was very interesting just to see how it all becomes grist for the mill <laughs> yes yes and uh you see you see Darren in that paper trying to make sense of everything that his friends have done up to that point and trying to situate their behaviors inside of these academic theories and not always doing so successfully. But you, you sense that he's struggling basically to make sense of his life and to make all of the pieces fit together, which is a challenge for any of us. I think that's probably one of the greatest personal challenges, having complete integrity between yourselves, your various selves. And that's what Darren is after, having integrity between his various selves, the the son who's from the South, the, the student who's on the West Coast, 
the brave student who's keen on social justice, who wants to impress Candace. He wants to bring all these things together. And that's hard. Very, very. What I thought you did really well is I could hear those people's voices on the left coast as well as Braggsville. I really had a sense of the way his father talked, of the way his cousin talked. Yeah, I was, I was definitely trying to uh, or hope to give the the regions uh, distinct sounds and then the characters within those regions their distinct voices because I think that the voice that a character has, of course, helps the reader distinguish that character from another. But I do also think that um, people are very attached to their own voices and the like sort of the vocal quality of their voice is something that is so much a part of their self-identity. So I felt that giving them these distinct ways of speaking was a way of honoring the full humanity of that character. I want to talk a little bit about writing this book. Did you outline? Did you know you, where you were going when you started? What, what was your process? You know, I, I definitely uh, didn't outline. At some point, I'll, I'll step back and look at the entire novel and and sort of think about the emotional flow. But usually uh, I start a novel with a feeling. So I have a feeling that's in my body and it's triggered by things I experience and things I read, people I talk to. And then the novel is for me the only way to get that feeling into the body of another human being. So as I'm writing this novel, it's sort of like I'm charting a ship by the stars and I keep correcting the course because I'm not exactly sure where I am relative to anything other than that feeling uh, to which I'm headed. So once I feel I get close to that, then I can go back and kind of smooth things out. But initially, everything is just trying to get uh, closer to a a crystallization of this uh, state of being that I couldn't otherwise put into words. And, you know, with this one in particular, I did do a lot of writing when I was traveling on my cell phone. I I wrote a lot of little bits and pieces on the cell phone to get me started. Wow, I'm impressed. You were brought up in New Orleans. Tell me about your upbringing. Yes, well, I grew up between New Orleans and Columbia, Maryland. My, My childhood was split between New Orleans, which I think everyone has some kind of an idea of in their mind. And then on the other hand, I was spending time in Columbia, Maryland, which is a planned community. It's a suburb between D.C. and Baltimore. So I, I had these two very different experiences, one that I, I think of as a planned community and the other as a planned chaos. I had a very broad range of um, thinking about what life could or could not be. And were you a reader when you were a kid? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I was a, I was a big reader. I, I actually was not allowed to watch much TV at all by by either of my parents. My parents were divorced. My father became an attorney, and then my, my mother ended up uh, running a, a medical newspaper. And so they both valued books and education over everything else, and they both instilled in me what a lot of parents of color instill in their children, which is a work ethic guided by the belief that you have to work twice as hard to be accepted as an equal in in this country if you're a person of color. Like Charlie. Exactly, like Charlie. Charlie, yes. My parents were very keen readers, keen on me reading, and big proponents and advocates for education. When did you first think that writing might be your path? A few months ago, my mother found an old report card from second grade. The teacher had written, he likes to write very long stories. (laughs) Very long. (laughs) And, and, And so I wanted to do that from the, from the beginning. You know, I think that uh, around 18 or 19, I did not know exactly how one would go about being a writer or what that meant. And, and so I did have a long detour of what I call in order to's, like the things you do in order to do what you really want to do. So I worked in finance. I worked in real estate. I, I did a lot of things before I finally realized that I had to make writing a priority if it was something that I wanted to pursue. And you teach. I do. I do teach rather frequently. I'm the University Endowed Chair in Creative Writing at Texas State University in San Marcos and doing some 
teaching with uh, Oregon State University. So uh, a little bit here and there and mostly writing though. I try to avoid thinking of any day as being complete if I have not gotten any writing done. You're teaching creative writing. What writing advice do you give students? My, my most constant advice is that if this is something you want to do, if you want to be a novelist or a short story writer, then set the time aside and, and make it a regular practice. You know, I think that's probably my most consistent advice. And then finally, what are you working on? I'm working on a couple of things. So I'm, I'm working on a two novels that I'll, I'll just say are set in, in the future, sometime at least a few days after tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's time enough, actually. <laughs> Geronimo, thank you. It really was a pleasure talking with you. And thank you for this book. It was... Uh, quite a read. I was captivated by it and, and shocked and laughed and surprised and thought about it a lot. So thank you. Well, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And, and thank you for inviting me to be on the podcast. That's author T. Geronimo Johnson talking about his award-winning novel, Welcome to Braggsville. You've been listening to Artworks, produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. To find out how art works in communities across the country, keep checking the Artworks blog or follow us at NEA Arts on Twitter. For the National Endowment for the Arts, I'm Josephine Reed. Thanks for listening.